We all wore the same missionette uniform too. White shirt, purity and submission, navy blue skirt, a believer for the Lord, and a little gold pin, golden streets of glory, stamped M in the middle and pinned to our shoulder. We'd sit around a middle table in an empty part of the church, ten little girls, number paint and Jesus face and oil, and eating vanilla wafers and drinking red Kool-Aid until our lips were red as a horde of Jezebels. We had a huge responsibility on our little white shoulders. Just by sitting there, we were setting good examples and winning souls to Christ, and it was unfortunate that nobody could see us. After the, <laughs> after the Jesus faces and the Kool-Aid ran out, the pastor's wife lined us up to test our memories on books of the Bible. My limit was about seven. I'd go straight for the easy ones first, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then I'd hop over to what I call the devil chapters, Deuteronomy and Revelation. Finally, I gave up with the easiest one of all, Genesis. I think our childhoods are the circumstances that create our destiny because I believe we all have a destiny and mine was this activism and if I had not went through the trials of coming to grips with my fundamentalist Pentecostal religion, I would have never been the activist nor the writer. I don't think, I think it took me being the activist to be able to write the book, The Unreasonable Woman, and then it gave me the confidence because because a lot of women in the South, and especially you know, small rural Texas, is you do not have confidence as a woman, you know. And and I remember, uh, I, if I can remember one thing about my dad, and he, you know, and he wasn't a bad man at all, but it was like, you know, it was like you stupid woman, and so you get the idea that you are not valuable at all. And so I think the whole deal about writing, it has to do about your confidence and the value you, you feel you have. And, and once I wrote The Unreasonable Woman, it was like this story was just waiting and begging to be told. And I, you know, I had no doubt, I had no doubt that this would, book would be written. I was raised Pentecostal. And uh, Pentecostal is kind of like the, uh, uh, it's like the mystical end of the fundamentalist. Of, and one thing they definitely believed in was speaking in tongues. They believed they had the same gifts that the prophets had in Jesus' day. And when Jesus could heal, we could heal. And if they could raise the dead, we could raise the dead. And uh, I know uh, one of the more peculiar and odd things that they could do is that we were felt that we were given the um, commandment to um, handle snakes. Matter of fact, uh, it was almost a, uh, a sign of your faith if you could handle snakes. And if you were bit, it was like you had lost your faith. Mama's pregnancies were hellacious. First she vomited her guts out and then she cried about it. If that wasn't enough to cement the connection between hell and pregnancy, six months into her fourth pregnancy and while hanging out a wash tub of wet clothes on a line tied to a rain cistern where rats and birds fell plus we got our water, a blood clot froze in her eyes and she went blind in one eye. But one eye and one year later, Mama had me. Nothing slowed down her baby train. It was October, the dead last phase of the moon, and summer-like with the windows open but screened to keep out the mosquitoes that were always worst after dark. I was delivered howling like a banshee in my grandma's bed by Aunt Tini. Some of the best parts of the Pentecostal was that it had a firm belief in the invisible world, like there were there was a, a, a sphere out there that it was uh, popled, peopled with uh, angels and demons, and that you know, like uh, if you were in, had times of troubles, there was. Jesus always right there, and you could ask him personally. And, and matter of fact, the most important thing about Pentecostal was it was a personal experience. So there was a real sense of the invisible, and uh, uh, and and I feel quite frankly that that was real important for me later on because uh, you know when when you start, uh, especially working on the bay, to believe in the invisible world where nature is out there and the water is out there and it's like, it's personified, it's uh, a force to be reckoned with and you can ally with it. And uh, that was the best part of the Pentecostal, but unfortunately, the side that eventually caused me 
to drop it entirely was the fear and the condemning and the judgment. I'm a fourth generation shrimper from a small fishing village and in 1989 after we had a huge dolphin die off all our bays started having algae blooms and the shrimp started disappearing I started running a fish house and one day I had a shrimper with cancer throw me this newspaper article and it was the first time the toxic release inventory was ever released to the public and uh, what that toxic release inventory was was industry reporting, and that's petrochemical industry on the Texas Gulf Coast and all over the nation, were reporting for the first time what they were putting out in the air, out in their discharges in the bay, what they were trucking through your town in trucks, what you were putting in the landfills, and our little bitty county, no more than 15,000 in the entire county, we were number one in the nation for toxic disposal and we placed in other things like in injection wells and emissions in the air and we were placed in transference of hazardous waste out of the town and that information uh, it made me do something I'd never ever did before it was to just speak out I just called a meeting quite frankly and uh, and it was such a backlash my activism started right there. It was like a snowball rolling to hell. I just knew what I needed to do outside the box because I knew working inside would not work. So I started thinking outside the box and the first thing that dawned on me to put some leverage to try to change things was doing a hunger strike. And, and quite frankly, I thought of a hunger strike is because you don't need people, you don't need money, you don't need nothing except yourself going without food. And, uh, and I'm pretty uh, focused and I had a great deal of intent on what I was doing. You know, Gandhi, you know, when he said when he did hunger strikes, it had soul power. And so that was where I was moving from. I was moving from my soul and it had a power and it was very intuitive, but it was like, it was creating all of this change out there. It was a real learning experience about uh, what putting yourself out there at risk. You know, it's, it's a little bit about your level of commitment. I was outraged that outlaws and compromising politicians and people looking for more riches could kill a bay and communities and they could do it. And I was outraged. So I, I was thinking of what, I had to do something. I had to do something to express my just outrage at the whole thing. And so I decided I was gonna take my shrimp boat out in that bay and I was gonna sink it right on top of their discharge. And uh, the only thing is I knew if I uh, sunk it with the motor in it, I have a big diesel engine, that they were going to, the only thing that was going to come out is that it was, there was that pollutant woman out there, you know, they were illegally discharging, but the story would have been this polluter woman putting diesel all over the bay. So I took the engine out, I gave it away, and I snuck out in the dead of night, and I had this boat towing me around, and my cousin saw me going around, so he called the Coast Guard, and uh, by the time I got around to the other end, not far from the discharge pipe, uh, there was three boatloads of Coast Guard out there in the middle of the bay. And they were out there on the back deck and he had a speaker and a slicker and he was looking for that terrorist on the high seas. And uh, he said I was going to get 15 years in the federal penitentiary and a $150,000 fine if I dared sink that shrimp boat out there. And I was like, I do not care. I'm going to sink this boat. And uh, eventually though, uh, when you got three boats that are chasing you and you don't have a motor, uh, you don't get very far. So eventually they tied, you know, they ended up pulling my boat to the harbor and tying it up. I, I think they had about 15 ropes on it. And it was that action that made the corporation finally say, what is it going to take to shut her up? You know, and that's when I said, well, do zero discharge, you know, recycle your waste stream. And so that's, that's the way I got Formosa to do a zero discharge and recycle their waste stream.